Um, I think I've got two uh, kind of main areas that I kind of take from your presentations. And one is um, at what point uh, there's a kind of a limit to what you've been doing that causes a withdrawal or a refusal and this kind of moment of kind of having to stand back and rethink and like you've kind of articulated it in slightly different ways like you and Joe saying um, you kind of started this project sort of based on sort of rage um, and I just um, in a way this is kind of what a sort of a process of consciousness raising is meant to do it's meant to uh, give you a sense of political realization to live life differently um, and that's not necessarily something that I want you to talk to me about, but maybe what you could say a bit more about is the kind of the activities that you've moved into. I'm thinking, Caroline, when you said about your campaigning being a kind of a massive conceptual artwork to kind of unpack what that is. Um, and Carla, perhaps you could talk more about what you're doing in Walthamstow and kind of uh, almost this kind of moving in of the art world and then moving out. Uh, like what kind of movement you find in your own practice and then Andrea perhaps you could sort of elaborate a bit more on kind of where ISP <coughs> is going in terms of like the, the sort of the toys that you've been making in relation to Serpentine because um, you all work within spheres that might be seen as kind of alongside kind of the art gallery I mean what the showroom has done is often taken the idea of kind of outreach or community <coughs> program or the education section and make it the main gallery program. So just these kind of shifts. Um, Caroline, would you like to start? Yeah, sure. Um, um, and I think you know, the decision to go and study engineering was partly because it was driven by wanting to um, understand the grammar of engineering and be able to speak engineering and make use the grammar of engineering within my work. Um, but it was also uh, an absolute disgust with the beginnings of the kind of rampant commercialized commercialization of the art <coughs> where um, you know Saatchi was going around buying up people's degree shows and making value by doing that. And so it was a kind of you know a, a sort of refusal of that combined with a desire to find out about engineering. Um, but this idea of the sort of life as a massive conceptual artwork, I sort of feel as if there have been two of these conceptual artworks. One of which is the engineering degree, which I do have contained in boxes. And there, there almost was a moment where I thought, you know, this is, you know, if anyone wanted to ever look at it, the whole thing exists, every single lecture, seminar, um, every different mathematical calculation I did, you know, it, it's all packed up like a beautiful conceptual artwork. Um, and, but it enabled me to, well, A, to learn an awful lot about the world, and I think that has fed into my green politics in that I, I speak science, I do, you know, I speak maths, I can speak to the engineers um, at Transport for London when they're um, saying things that, you know, are preventing good things happening on our streets. Um, so, you know, in a sense, that was one conceptual artwork, but I think also my practice as a politician, um, it's not art. Um, I, I am working as a politician these days, and that is how I'm intervening with communities, that's how I'm trying to make a difference and to, you know, in the world. Um, but I think the, the, the kind of the, the grammar, the language, you know, just producing banners and placards for demonstrations about um, housing protests or stop the war events. You know, you kind of, um, if you, you know, if you, if you understand um, art practice, I think you engage with all of that in a slightly different way. And, um, it's, uh, you know, you understand the, the complexity of language, of, of visual grammar, um, in a way that's very useful and I think very helpful um, within a campaigning context. Does that sort of... Um, yeah, that's what I'm thinking. Yeah, I'll let someone else. Um, yeah, I think for me there's no actual exit, but... I think um, being more comfortable about the position that I inhabit as an artist, as a practitioner in, 
and being involved in many projects. I think for a really long time I was quite um, anxious you know, about progression or career or trying to uh, achieve a certain sustainability of my own practice, you know, being able to make a living, um, being able to uh, not only to afford my practice, no, because the uh, majority of the time we are putting money into our own production, it's a bit of a contradiction, and, um, and, and also, yeah, finding partnerships. And it was quite recently, actually, that I realized that I've been um, boycotting myself constantly, so I've, I've been doing this acts of, of self-denial and, and exit and things that uh, you could say that damage your career, as having children being one of them, no, perhaps, <laughs> um, but not, uh, not doing the, uh, one of the, the main things, I think, from, at least from uh, the, my um, education as an artist in a, in a fine art academy in Portugal, of, of the necessity of having a signature, and by this they meant a style, a recognizable style, where your artwork doesn't need, you know, it's ultimately recognizable as soon as people see it, they know, oh, this is from by so-and-so. And so I've, I've constantly been doing different things and changing and changing medium and changing my type of practice and engaging and collaborating, so I kind of realize that um, I've been boycotting myself and my possible reputation, and I've been just you know, uh, damaging it. How do you work within your PhD? Like, how do you work as a singular artist engaged with these collective practices? Yeah, it's, it's, it's also full of contradictions because my practice has, has, be, has become um, more and more collaborative. I've been questioning my own authority and authorship as, as an artist and um, working with communities but then still I was doing a PhD research, research and claiming knowledge on my own name because PhDs are you know, um, supposedly to be in individual. It's quite difficult to um, have a collective authorship. I think at Goldsmith there was an attempt with uh, Phil and Gallia that managed kind of a half collaborative PhD with different conclusions you know, to, to be able to have uh, the different awards. Um, so I think that's, that's quite important. It was quite important for me this starting now, starting, oh yeah, there's still always this seduction, but starting now to feel comfortable. Um, and that, so the, my research um, led to, to think about um, how can we construct um, yeah, networks of solidarity. And that, that led uh, to the creation or the in initiating this discussion in Walthamstow through a group that is called Walthamstow Performing Arts Collective, which is a group of people who are all um, practitioners of live art uh, in the diverse fields from dance, from uh, physical theater, musicians. Um, and we are looking to create a, a venue to rehearse and to practice in the borough, but that would be uh, shaped as a cooperative and how can we go about, uh, which is, yeah, quite difficult. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, yeah, so, so the question was in and out in relation to the serving band. Yeah, so I'm kind of interested in this kind of negotiating, mm -hmm. uh, kind of because Invisible Space of Parenthood, I, I guess, has had uh, success and then has had invitations to new spaces, and the Serpentine might be a kind of an interesting example to kind of explore about when you are given kind of space and authority, and then what you choose to do with it. Um, so. Yes, it's, uh, it's really interesting, because I was, I was thinking something that I hadn't realized until this morning, so I'm still processing, but this idea of finding that, that maybe, maybe this kind of problem between the in and out uh, is, is about finding, is about inhabiting the art world, but then in your own terms and, and making it work for you or like not um, fulfilling. And I feel there's something really interesting about Invisible Sources of Parenthood is that it usually works with the public program or the educational area of a gallery, um, which in the end is great because that's sort of like the feminist part, that's when people can do things. So I got, I got to do so many things in the Serpentine until we had to do something at the Serpentine and then uh, my curator had to present, who's an educational curator, had to present to the whole of the Serpentine and they were like, 
how has this been going on? Uh, so I kind of, I really, um, I feel really, it, it's funny because I think at the beginning, I sort of resented that a bit. I'd be like, why are we, you know, it's because the project that is about this type of labor and this type of engagement, so we kind of like get to kind of sidetrack the gallery. But I think more and more, I just learned to appreciate those, those positions. And um, the Serpentine project uh, was a commission to do something with early years education that result, that will result in a, a toy, a game, or a manual. And we decided to do this project that is about recovering this history of how the invention of kindergarten, um, there's a theory that says that the invention of kindergarten is responsible for abstraction in modern art, and the reason this hasn't been recognized is because this is a labor that is done by women. So we, we, we've done these toys, uh, which are ready, just like printing the, the text, and the, uh, the working with like uh, Short Star Center, the same Short Star Center I work here, so it's a place that I have been working on and off for, I guess, four or five years now. And this, these toys come with this manual that talks about, talk, talk about these histories and we work with them to develop some things around the politics of play and come to kind of these feminist narratives and now they're gonna go back to different nurseries and gonna be distributed as subjects. So this never goes, this is never gonna be shown in a gallery as an art project, although it is financed as, a, as an art project. Um, I was gonna say something else, but I don't. Oh, no, another thing that I was gonna say that's really funny is that, so the, my, uh, Alex Thorpe, which is my curator, um, is still looking for other people. They have funding for quite a lot of artists to work with early education, and it's so hard. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I keep like puzzling why it is so hard to find um, artists that are interested in work. And there's something really amazing if you work with, um, so like social practice or participatory practice that children this age, they don't, they, they are really happy not to participate, which is really great. So if you do something like with an, with an, with an artist and grown-ups, it's really kind of easy to coerce them and kind of force people to take part. <laughs> with like a, a four-year-old child just look at you and be like, I don't want to do this. And they just like <laughs> walk away and you cannot force them, which I find really politically exciting. And just like, oh, please keep that forever. <laughs> it's like the, knowing that you don't have to participate is the most important thing you can, mm -hmm. you can carry on. And one of the things that she heard back, and I don't, I don't know which artist said this, so I feel like I can, I can say that because I'm not gonna get her into trouble, hopefully. But, he said, but this person said that, this artist said, and I don't know if it was a man or a woman, it said um, that working with early years education was career poison. <laughs> <laughs> which I thought was really interesting. So you're intentionally poisoning your career. Yeah, exactly. And, and in the long run, finding a very sort of, uh, uh, fulfilling way of, uh, of practicing. Creating a practice. Yeah, I think well, I think it kind of shows you yeah, what's mm -hmm. the art relation with this type of work, and I think what mm -hmm. is interesting, mm -hmm. what I'm interested in doing. Okay, so I think I'll open it up um, <coughs> to the audience. Does anyone have any questions? Louise has got the roving mic. I know it's getting near the sort of evening time now. This is for Andrea. Um, you mentioned a place that was somehow political, but then it was dispersed in your talk, and I didn't quite catch what you were saying. I think I just... the Short Star Center that I work here, um, and it's being closed, it's probably going to be closed by the end of next year. And it's really, um, I, think, I think what I've been thinking lately is in, in terms of what these early years education spaces are, because uh, there are spaces that you you get like the women that go there uh, or like men, but it's usually women to drop their children um, to the nursery. But they're also quite involved. Uh, nurseries are still like really open spaces where you can really interact with like who's taking care of your child and, and have these relationships. Uh, but they also have things like an ESO class, um, which is quite important here in the neighborhood. And and again, things like talking to them, they were saying that the ESO um, classes, so the uh, English for uh, foreign. English as a foreign language are really important in terms of domestic violence. There has a lot of domestic violence that has come made visible. So it sort of work a bit like consciousness raising groups in a sense. And that's been completely shut down uh, since 
I think this year that is already being shut down. So it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's really sad. Caroline has something to say about that. I'm just thinking about the connections between your activism and then perhaps the spaces in which the two artists are working and how those things can perhaps correlate or, or not necessarily. Uh, I, yes, I mean, domestic violence is a huge issue and with the terrifying government cuts that are hitting all local authorities, we are seeing services for women in particular being cut down and certainly the work that children's centres are doing um, is incredibly important for supporting women. So the people working in children's centres are working to support women back into employment as well as looking, to, looking after children. Um, so the kind of space, I mean, particularly at the moment where um, and when I was talking about different models of doing things, and I was uh, speaking only very briefly, but it feels the way that this current government is working to shut down every element of the state, the space that opens up for projects like yours, working with, um, uh, you know, within that kind of childcare um, situation is absolutely huge. And the scope for art-led interventions and projects um, is, is, is actually, you know, is, is potentially really important. And I talked briefly about Islington Park Street, which is this group home where people have been looking after each other. Now, there's been a, um, a study done by, and I can't remember which of the London University, I think it was LSE, have done the study on the value to the local authority of this group home where people's needs, so support for people who've experienced domestic violence, support for this older man with Parkinson's disease, um, there's someone who was a care leaver who's been living in the group home for 25 years now um, who has special educational needs and then there's a mixture within the 18 people there's a mixture some people are just people on very low incomes um, mainly working in creative um, areas of work there so there's quite a few actors and um, musicians um, in in that house um, but you know, that as a model for living, sort of taking it into a housing model of providing, um, effectively of providing adult social care and support, which is actually saving local authority budgets, but it's doing it in a creative way. It's doing, doing um, cooperative housing differently. Um, is actually a model that I think all housing associations and local authorities are going to have to start looking at. Because if they don't start thinking completely differently and using that kind of creativity and thinking outside the linear boxes of the ways that local authorities have delivered services and supported communities hitherto, where actually everything's just going to, going to collapse. Um, and um, I mean, I think this next budget round for local authorities is going to be the most extreme that anyone has ever seen. And, you know, watch out for the protests, you know, about, you know, we are all going to have to be standing up for services, you know, supporting women who've experienced domestic violence. We're going to be, um, you know, just services for people with disabilities, services for older people. You know, everything is cut to the bone and there's nothing left to cut. So unless there is a kind of a, blossoming of a reworking and a way of working differently and actually people involved in creative practice can potentially engage with that and make really incredible stuff happen, um, you know, then maybe London will be a city that's <laughs> worth living in. But, um, you know, but it is very depressing what's happening at the moment. Um, I just want to make a a point about um, space. If one thinks about, say, Tate Modern as an, as an instantiation of the establishment, and one thinks about it spatially, um, one thinks that the, the curator and the critic, even the historian, and the way that they support that institution are gatekeepers for the glorification of heroes that are known in advance. Then if you think of the other pole, and you think of the space of life, 
it's a completely open topology. So the Tate would be a closed topology, a closed space. Life would be completely open. But I think what's insisting across your practices is an open, closed topology. So that the inside is folding the outside in, and the outside is, being folded, is folding the inside in. So you get this enfoldment, this kind of mutual enfoldment between inside and outside. Um, so I was just thinking, so what you get, uh, what I'm hearing across your practices, is an asymmetrical topology that unworks geographies and ecologies of domination, finding holes and folds in the infrastructure that unwork through this mutual folding of the inside and the outside in the complex ways that you're doing it. And then I'm just thinking of conversations that have taken place here between, say, Chris Durkon and Emily Pethick here in this very space um, ages ago, where Chris Durkon's sort of fantasy about what he could do at the Tate was this pivoting of the transatlantic access to the rest of the world, but at the same time not wanting it to just be a, 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 a a sponge, to sponge up the rest of the world, but to try and transform social relations in some way, and accepting that the Tate's just too big, it can't do it. So it has relationships with smaller organi organizations, like the showroom, that are experimenting with these new practices that open and close and mutually enfold the outside and the inside. So I just wanted to sort of put like a spatial sort of analysis of what I think's been going on mm. here. Okay, thank you. Do any of you want to respond to that? I mean, it's kind of more of a comment than a question. Apart from just to go jazz hands, yes, <laughs> that makes a lot of sense. <laughs> I'm entirely opposed to the take doing that. I think on a class basis, on every base I can think, the money should be taken away from the Tate and handed to the organizations to do their own work. There should not be an, an elite structure imposed. If you look at Oval House, which is just near the National Theatre, not far from the Tate, they run proper, long-term, continuous workshops for young migrants and refugees. They run them over years. The National Theatre runs six week, or whatever it is, workshops for migrants and refugees. The money should be taken away from the National Theatre. Those organizations need to be independent and have their own right to exist, however big or however small. The whole notion of handing Arts Council money to regional organizations so they can pay their administration costs and filter the money through is a disgrace to the independent, I mean, I will talk about the independent theatre movement when, when I speak, but it's a disgrace. We don't want an elite structure. It should go. It should go and leave us alone. <laughs> yes, <laughs> leave us alone. I don't object to the National Theatre, and it must be there. It's got lots, a certain number of jobs for actors in it. I'm a member of equity, and so I'm not going to say close it down. They'll lose their jobs. So will the stage managers. So will the front of house staff. We're probably being paid rubbish wages on our taxes. But please, let's not support the elite creeping into our areas of work. We want independence of some sort of independence. It isn't real independence. Can I just respond Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean... I wasn't making, trying to apologize for the Tate. I was just trying to sort of report on a history that has actually taken place between Tate and this, this institution that we're sitting in, okay? You're having a go at it. But if you take, for instance, what's happening in Greece and Grexit, the whole question of whether Greece should leave, the, uh, Greece should leave and Grexit, they can't. They're existing within a, 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 a neoliberal financialization. They can't exit. So they have to appear to submit while actually preparing for a rupture, hoping that at some point in the future you can look back and, that there's, and see that there was a rupture. So that's the point that I'm making. I mean, we, we can't do it, we can't exit. Like the Greeks can't Grexit from Europe. We're not in that sort of position. So the most we can hope for is a militant strategy of asymmetrical that unworks domination in this open, closed apology. I think Caroline wants to say something. Well, thing. yes, I, I, I suspect there may be a sort of a, 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 a misunderstanding that's happened because I, 
I would certainly not have said jazz hands to um, a top-down approach. Um, and I had heard the the idea of, you know, Tate is like sort of curator, critic, historian, gate, gatekeepers of culture. And I heard that as a bad thing. Um, and, and I heard it being spoken about as a bad thing, um, being really simplistic. Um, and, you know, this kind of... The, 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 this idea of um, this mutual enfoldment, you know, the, it almost, um, I was imagining that as it enabling space for kind of disruptive practices. And I would absolutely agree with you that we need to make sure that small, in, small institutions working bottom up, working with communities, are going to do an awful lot more than these very big top heavy organisations. And I think all the top heavy arts organisations in London need to be really thinking about how they engage with audiences, how they work, engage with communities, and you know what uh, what, what their practice of engagement is, because the um, yes, the, the the scope within again within the context of an incredibly cut public sector, the the um, place for elite organisations um, who practice an elite practice just seems, you know, it seems wrong when we have no money to house Syrian refugees, we have no money in our local authorities to provide adult social care to people who are living in extreme poverty, we have families who are dependent on food banks, you know, all of that. Um, it, but I do think that there is a place for culture and I do think that, but I think that culture needs to play its part in being part of this community that is really under stress at the moment. Okay, okay say something as well. I, and I understand there is a, yeah, there is a codependence between the, the larger institutions and perhaps small or even grassroots. And All My Independent Women does fit into that. Since 2010, all these exhibitions have been recipient of public funding. And it, it is perhaps when I was saying that the uh, Waltham Stowe Performing Arts Collective is a difficult discussion and it's perhaps now a, a little bit um, yeah, f frozen, it's because we have a, a massive uh, disagreement within, within the group where um, part of the group, and I am included, we think we should be absolutely independent economically and try to find different ways of supporting ourselves and supporting finding a model, an economic model to support the venue that will be independent of any, any funding. While in the other part of the group wants to start already to program and to curate in host um, uh, spaces within the borough, so mainly pubs, to raise um, profile, to have a portfolio, to then apply for grants <coughs> and eventually maybe even get a free space from the council, which I think it's it's just a utopian dream that will not going to happen in the, in the current um, situation. So I think, yeah, we need to we need to find models that don't need that codependence, perhaps. Thank you. Are there any more questions? Well, I think what this panel starts to do is show perhaps some of the kind of urgent reasons that uh, people are returning to things like Kalalonzi's. Um, thoughts on withdrawal and refusal in a moment of uh, crisis and sort of dissolution, not just in the art world, but kind of in our wider social structures. Um, and I think it is really important to try and have these conversations together and try and share tactics that might work, tactics that might um, have failed, uh, tactics that might work if more of us are kind of there doing them. So. Um, I think this kind of in or out of the art world really points to a much bigger uh, kind of question of where we are within kind of social systems and how we view success uh, both as individuals and um, as a collective. And I think kind of uh, feminist uh, thinking can really help us on this. So I think we should leave it there. I'd like to thank our panellists and the audience.